Hello, and welcome to the Alpine Valley School Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Gallivan. This is episode 34 of the Alpine Valley School Podcast. For show notes on this episode, please visit alpinevalleyschool.com slash podcast slash EP34 for episode 34. Today's podcast comes to us from Hudson Valley Sudbury School, a sister school of ours in upstate New York. I was fortunate enough to attend a talk given at HVSS called Voices of Radical Education, where various members of the community spoke about their experience with Sudbury education. All of the talks were wonderful, but one of them stuck out in my mind as extraordinary. It's this talk I'd like to share with you today. From Hudson Valley Sudbury School, this is Wendy Piper sharing the story of her family. The first day of kindergarten. So full of joy and excitement, anxieties. I couldn't wait to talk to the classroom teacher, but she was much too busy, so we scheduled a meeting with the school principal. We walked into her office, she motioned for us to sit down. She folded her hands behind her desk. She looked me square in the eye and she said, let me begin by saying no one believes your daughter belongs here. That was the first time we heard that in an educational setting, but it wouldn't be the last. You see, our daughter has special needs. From the time she was born, life was a whirlwind of doctor's visits and therapy appointments and things to work on at home. But we had done a pretty good job of academically keeping her with her peers, so we had no idea how rocky the start to school was going to be. Before long, they can be in an IDP meeting. If you're familiar, it stands for Individualized Education Plan. In theory, it's where teachers and parents and therapists get together and they discuss what the best plan of action is for each individual student. Our experience, however, was that we sat at one end of the table and a group of experts sat at the other, some of whom knew our child for all of 30 minutes, and they proceeded to tell us exactly what they wanted to do with our child. They wanted to discuss placement. Placement meant they wanted to put her in a self-contained classroom. We had always been big advocates for inclusion. I never understood why we segregate our kids. Our society isn't segregated. Why are our children? So when the meeting rolled around, they got pretty good at advocating. I knew my rights. I knew the lingo. And I had made a pretty good case for keeping her in her classroom. My last argument had no legal merit whatsoever. And it was that she's already established here and she's made friends, and it's not fair to move her now. To which the department chair sat back, rolled her eyes, and said, It's not like she has any real friends. She'll never have any real friends. One of the greatest regrets of my life is not challenging that statement right then and there, but I was stunned. I won that argument but I didn't leave feeling victorious. I left with the realization that I could fight all I wanted to keep her in that classroom, but I could never make them want her there. And that idea of real friends has stayed in my heart for a long time. I looked at her relationship to school and how often they were the teacher's helpers or they were the seat fillers or they were asked to you know, spend time with her. Maybe they were right. So needless to say, we left public education. Um, the next couple of years were filled with every possible educational scenario you can think of. We tried Catholic school, we tried private school, we tried arts programs. Each one started the same way. It started with a conversation about her extensive level of need and how that school could possibly meet those needs. She was always different. She always had accommodations. She was always on the fringe. And in large part, she was alone. So eventually, we got tired of fighting for inclusion and we moved to homeschool, which was bad. It was pretty good. Um, we kept up with therapists through the district, we kept up with tutors through the district. And we started to get these reports. Every five weeks, we get reports home to tell us how she was doing. We got really good at the progress. 
and I got really obsessed with these reports. We celebrated every jump, five inches further than it was, you know, 10 weeks ago, and we celebrated every sound set 10% clearer. I don't even know what that means, but we celebrated. But as if somehow those reports began to justify my effectiveness as a parent. It was around this time that the school district sent us to a developmental pediatrician who sent us to a geneticist who sent us to various specialists. And our daughter became a medical puzzle to solve. And I remember one morning, I was sitting at my desk at work, and the phone rang, and it was the nurse. And she said, are you sitting down? Never a good way to start. <laughs> so she said, we believe your daughter has something called pyruvate dehydrogenase complex deficiency, but we need to do more testing. So I Googled while she spoke, and it's fatal. So imagine for a second what that moment was like for us. The next eight weeks were the longest eight weeks of our life. I did not sleep. I was the queen of Google research. I could tell you anything you wanted to know about pyruvates, the Krebs cycle, and energy production. We did a lot of soul searching, and we cried a lot. In the end, the test came back negative, thankfully. But we were changed by that experience profoundly. And I was left with this nagging question. If she died tomorrow, would we be happy with the way she lived? And a hard look around at that moment, and the answer was no. To this point, we had pretty much spent her entire childhood focused on a future that was never guaranteed. We spent so much time in legal jargon, and we spent so much time on progress, that we forgot that today matters. Right now matters. So at this point, we went from homeschooling to unschooling, because we were determined to value every single day. But she still spent a lot of time alone. I actually heard of Sudbury, when it first opened, and I came for an informational meeting. And the, the concept thrilled me, but I could not get my head around how they could meet her extensive level of need. But at this point, we had nothing to lose. So we came back to give it another look. We came to an open house, and we started the same way we always did, or I did at least, by detailed discussions of what her needs were and questions about how that school could meet them. And I remember the staff was very polite, nodded unknowingly, and then they turned and spoke directly to my child. And I remember feeling silly. <laughs> like I never realized how often we talk around her as adults. And that's my first suburb lesson. <laughs> so, we decided to give it a try. The school was really vibrant and exciting, and it started off great. But I spent the first year waiting for somebody to tell me that we didn't belong. Waiting for someone to say that their needs are too great and you need to leave. So, a turning point for me came about three months into the school year. Our daughter came home one day and she was upset. She hated Sudbury. She was going back to homeschool. And when we got to the bottom of it, I realized she had been some, sent to something called JC. <laughs> I don't think I need to do this. I'll do it anyway. So, JC is the Judiciary Committee here at Sudbury. And anybody can write anybody up for rule infractions. And JC comes together as a body of peers to offer consequences and hear both sides of the story. And she'd done in trouble, I'll say, for running in the halls. <laughs> and she pled not guilty. She was guilty. <laughs> she had no idea what to do with that. I thought about it for a minute, and I realized she spoke, her voice was heard, and there was a potential consequence for that voice. There was no teacher explaining away her behavior. There was no aide uh, speaking for her. It was just her responsible for herself. And that was huge. And then my panic crept in. Uh, here we are, this is it. This is where they will tell us that we don't belong, that our needs are too great, that we need to leave. So 
I typed an email explaining the situation and that she wanted to change her plea and I raised myself. Nothing happened. They changed her plea and life went on. <laughs> she was a fully functioning member of this school. As a parent of a child with special needs, all we ever want is for them to be as relevant in their world as everybody else in it. We tried every educational setting you could think of, and this was the only one that could give us that. So we've been here for coming into our eighth year now, and we couldn't be happier. Here, our daughter is fully herself. Last year, 16 years old, um, we came into school, she was dressed head to toe in her Supergirl costume, and she had Princess Yara on her head. Over her shoulder, her bag of her favorite dolls. Nobody teased her. Nobody chastised her. She, she was praised for her creativity and for her passion. She's been on school field trips. She's been in school plays. She goes to school meeting. She comes home really passionate about how she's going to vote because she knows that vote means as much as anyone else's. She's had the time and the space that it takes to build relationships. And guess what? She has real friends. Yeah. She has friends. <laughs> she has friends that greet her with excitement when she gets here. She has friends that invite her for play dates. Friends that have chosen her as surely as she has chosen them. Sudbury has been a wonderful opportunity for our family to stop, to forget about progress, and to enjoy every day with her. Um, and it's given me an opportunity to rethink that idea of special needs. Guess what? Those ideas were, or those special needs were never hers. It was the school that needed the accommodation. It was the school that needed the aids. It was the educational system that needed the supports. Her needs, patience, tolerance, trust, Respect. Every student gets that here. Her needs were not special. And finally, if we go back to that question that plagued us for so long, if she died tomorrow, would we be happy with the way she did? And here at Sudbury, finally, we can answer with an emphatic, resounding, big fat yes. <laughs> Thank you to Hudson Valley Sudbury School for allowing me to use the audio from their talk. If you want to find out more about their school or view the original video associated with this talk, please check out the show notes for this episode at alpinevalleyschool.com slash podcast slash EP34. Thank you for listening. I'm Mark Gallivan. This is the Alpine Valley School podcast, and we'll be back again soon with more stories of real learning for real life. <laughs>